When it comes to Chainsaw Man, something has been bugging me for a long time. People's perception of Tatsuki Fujimoto's writing and the themes he wanted to convey through his story. Since I've started reading this manga, one point has come up repeatedly, an argument that perplexes me and which I intend to track down the source of and definitively refute it using the source material and other external entities. This claim is that Denji and Power's relationship is solely platonic, the old they're siblings statement that comes up over and over again. Honestly, I don't care what you ship, but I feel like this statement shows a misunderstanding of Tatsuki Fujimoto's writing. Power and Denji are more than simply platonic. I wouldn't call them siblings either. Their relationship is far too intricate to just be reduced to that. Now before we get into my argument, where does this argument come from? If I were to guess, I'd say these three pages. First, let's look at chapter 79's front page that depicts Denji, Aki, and Power as children, similar to that of siblings. In fact, it does depict them as siblings. Now this would be a point in favor of the platonic argument if it wasn't for one minor or rather major detail. This image is from Aki's perspective. This entire arc is mainly about Aki. This entire chapter is mainly about Aki. He is coming to terms with the death of his old family and embracing a new one. Denji and Power are siblings to him. Now on to Exhibit B, Chapter 82, Page 9. After Makima kills Power, she goes into detail about how she pulled an Aizen, for a lack of a better term, and basically had a hand in creating the life Denji has now, saying that she gave him an older brother in Aki and a bratty little sister in power. Now, this would be valid, but to me at least, it doesn't make too much sense and I'll tell you why. Makima has no idea what goes on in the Hayakawa residence. She has no idea of the scope of the relationship that these three share. She only has what she believes based on her plans for Denji. Makima saying this should not be taken as concrete evidence to support the claim that they are solely platonic or share a sibling bond. Fujimoto is a very subtle writer. He uses not only words but visual imagery to tell his story. Manga is a visual medium of course and I feel like that side of manga is grossly misunderstood in the larger scheme of the anime and manga community but that's for another video. And as I said earlier, to support my claim, all evidence provided will be primarily using the Chainsaw Man manga and a few outside references here and there where I see fit. Let's take a look at every one of Denji's love interests in the series, one by one comparing their first appearances and their interactions. And in my opinion, find out what Tatsuki Fujimoto was trying to communicate to us, the audience. Let's start with Makima because I feel like her involvement would be rather short because it's very straight to the point. After being killed and given new life, the first thing Denji sees is a woman, a woman that embraces him, a boy who is in the heat of puberty, being embraced by an attractive woman. Makima is beautiful, she's supposed to come off as an angel, she gives Denji everything he wanted, the food he hadn't tasted before, a home, and even enticing him with a sexual relationship, in exchange for his loyalty as a devil hunter. Her devil hunter. He was intoxicated. It was love as first sight to him. It also helped that she was the control devil and he was an impressionable teenager. Keep in mind, Denji is only 16. He's easily manipulated as we see throughout the series. The relationship the two have is simple. Denji is lusting over Makima, this mysterious older attractive woman who could teach him so much. The first person besides Puchita to show him kindness. Makima is a manipulator, a groomer. She takes advantage of an impressionable young boy, all for the sake of her own agenda. Makima was never the end goal. She was never an option for Denji, no matter how you look at it. She was just a crush for our main protagonist. Someone to teach him a harsh lesson that most of us growing up learn. The only thing that Makima wanted was the chainsaw devil not Denji. He was just the unlucky sucker to be the Chainsaw Devil's host. 
Reize is the second person on our ladder, making her debut in chapter 40 of the manga appropriately titled Love Flower Chainsaw. We continue a subplot of Denji struggling with the idea of not having a heart. He thinks about Makima. The butterflies in his stomach could only mean that he has a heart. Makima is supporting to him. She comforts him, makes him feel better no matter what he finds himself worrying about. This is where we see more of that 16 year old mind come into play. He's adamant about thinking he'd never fall for anyone else. Makima is the only one for him. As his thoughts stray, the rain begins to fall. Searching for shelter, that's where he runs into Reize. I find it interesting that the rain had peaked during Denji's daydream of Makima and shines when he meets Reize. It's almost as if Fujimoto is trying to communicate using visual storytelling. Makima is a storm. Nothing good comes out of her, much like a rainy day. It ruins your plans, it's depressing depending on who you ask, but it could also be comforting, soothing, it can calm your nerves, help you sleep. It's a great indication of how Denji feels about Makima and what Fujimoto is trying to tell us about Makima. The rain lets up only when someone else enters the fray, that being Reize. A change of pace, a new fresh outlook on life. She invites him to her workplace and Denji wastes no time in coming. This is when their relationship begins. Her constant touching on Denji sends his mind into overdrive, like any boy his age with a lack of experience. He comes to one conclusion, the only conclusion that he could think of. She must like him. And not in a friendly way, something more romantic. And from Denji's perspective, regardless of experience or not, it's not hard to come to that conclusion. Denji calls to Makima for guidance, mentally at least. The idea of falling for someone other than her is scary to him, but he can't fight it. Denji describes his dilemma interesting. It gives us more insight into his thought process. Makima found my heart. My heart belongs to Makima. My body has other ideas. I can't help but draw a parallel to some lyrics from a certain R. Kelly song. My mind's telling me no. But my body, my body is telling me yes. Baby. The chemistry between these two in the next few chapters is charming. It's cute. It feels good. You as the reader can't help but feel happy for Denji. Anyone who's been in a relationship or around someone they like where feelings are reciprocated knows exactly what this feeling is. Fujimoto is able to capture the idea of young love perfectly. Even reading it now warms my heart and that's the point because what comes later shatters this illusion and just makes all of these moments hurt in retrospect. My heart belongs to Makima, but my body won't listen. Chapter 42 begins in a school, continuing from where we left off with Denji remarking he wished he could go to school with Reize. Sharing a few moments together in a classroom then escalates to the pair going for a swim. Reize suggests that they swim naked, and while this would not have any relevance on its own, it's Denji's reaction that's telling. Fujimoto illustrates Denji's anxiety beautifully here. He's having an inner struggle, something that I personally am familiar with. The feeling of betraying your morals, going against your word, feeling like you're about to make a mistake. Don't do it, Denji. If I go, my heart will go with my body. But before we know it, the rain returns. It's foreshadowing. The dreaded rain that accompanied the daydreams of Makima. The rain that became the sun with the introduction of Reze. Reze leaves Denji alone for a while. Alone to his thoughts. He's fighting an inner battle. Who does he go for? Reze? Makima? He can't decide. He's confused. And the fact that he sees both of them when he closes his eyes doesn't help either. This is where we see the glaring flaw in Denji's character. He's naive, quick to fall in love with the first woman that treats him kindly. It's superficial, idealistic, unrealistic, and unhealthy. This is where we're handed new information about Reze. She isn't who she appears to be. Chapter 44 is where it goes all downhill. After the two spend some time together at the festival, they are once again alone. Reze begs Denji to quit his job to run away with her but he's still indecisive. Rize is perceptive. She knows Denji likes someone else, and she puts him on the spot before stealing a kiss. Rize buys Denji's tongue clean off. You see, she was a Russian spy and a hybrid herself that was sent by the gun devil to take Denji's heart. 
yet another woman in his life took advantage of his naivety, using him for personal gain. Denji comes to this realization beautifully. While I was in so much pain, I thought I'd die. In the back of my confused brain, I thought about things real hard and I realized something. Every woman I meet tries to murder me. Everybody's after the chainsaw heart. But what about my heart? Denji's. Does nobody want that? Huh? Keep those words in mind because they will come up later. The fight inevitably comes to an end as they wake up on the shore. Despite everything that happened, Denji's still willing to forgive Rize, run away with her even. That's where Rize comes clean. Everything that happened between the two up to now was all an act. The smiling, the blushing, the romance, all a lie. But it didn't phase Denji. He can't bring himself to kill her. It would make him feel guilty. Our villainess walks off after breaking his neck and leaving him not with despair, but hope. She'd be at the cafe. Little did we know, this was the last time we or Denji would see Rize. At least until the final fight of the manga. Before she could resume life before all of this mess, Makima deals the killing blow as Denji sits alone, flowers clutched tightly. To me, the relationship between Denji and Rize is that of Kenshin and Tomoe. At first, Tomoe is out for revenge. She wanted Kenshin dead. He had stolen her happiness from her. He killed her fiance. Despite this, somewhere down the line, she fell in love with Kenshin while pretending. She saw another side of him. Alas, it could not be together, as the hit was already placed on Kenshin's head, leading to Tomoe's tragic death. Now, the circumstances aren't one to one, but the core idea of these love stories are the same, to me at least. But while Tomoe and Kenshin had months for their love to bloom, to my knowledge, this arc takes place within a few days, weeks at most, so it's safe to say that Rize didn't actually love Denji, but she at least began to warm up to him and felt bad for deceiving him, or perhaps she just didn't want to see him die. With Rize's chapter coming to an end, let's shift gears to the central focus of this video, the interesting relationship between our protagonist, Denji, and Power. Power makes her first appearance in Chapter 4, appropriately titled Power. This is where Makima introduces it to, not before Denji has an external crisis of sorts wanting to touch boobs. Something that drives all of Denji's actions throughout this arc. These trivial things when isolated seem just that, trivial. Fujimoto is trying to communicate here, rather he wants us not to forget that Denji is just a teenager trying to do teenage boy things in a world that either won't let him or won't make it easy for him. Power's not like every other woman we've seen before or after. Her introduction, at least when it comes to Denji's life, isn't comforting and warm like Rize. She isn't a savior like Makima, and most likely because she has nothing to hide like the other two. She's honest in how she acts. She's brash, rude, unapologetic, and not very ladylike. She's full of herself and cowardly and a liar. All very unpleasant traits. First impressions are everything as the saying goes, and as far as Denji and the audience is concerned, power left a very bad taste in our mouths. And it only gets worse. We do get a vulnerable moment with power in this chapter though, venting to Denji about her cat, Miaoi. Denji naturally doesn't care. I mean, why would he? He never wanted to be partnered up with her in the first place, but she persuades him with the promise of touching her chest if he helped. Naturally, he does just that. But what would be seen as a lighthearted moment soon turned into something far more sinister. We move on to chapter 6. Denji and Power share a moment on the train. He tries in a weird way to comfort her by opening up about his lost pet, Puchita. But Power doesn't really care. To put it bluntly, she doesn't believe in all that alive in your heart mumbo jumbo. Denji is obviously put down by this, but he stays strong in the hopes of feeling up some boobs when this is all over. With this exchange, we have a really amazing scene where Denji thinks to himself, there's no way I could be friends with this chick. This thought is followed by a beautiful panel showing the isolation and distance between the two. Given the context of later events, it just serves as Fujimoto laying out all of his chess pieces in perfect order, securing his victory before the match has even begun. Going back to what Denji has said to Rize, the same thing happens here. Another woman in his life trying to kill him. 
Power tells Denji that her story was, like many other things she says, a lie. She did need Denji's help saving her pet Miaoi, but not in the way he would have thought. The only way her cat would have been saved was in exchange for human blood. Denji just happened to be the unlucky donor. The bat devil deems his blood unworthy and in turn punishes power by eating Miaoi and then eating her as well. Before she is swallowed whole, she looks at Denji, recounting his story on the train ride earlier. He said you can't pet Puchita anymore. I know how you feel. It is an awful feeling, isn't it? Denji comes to her rescue. Even though he had every right to let her die for what she did to him, he still sympathizes with her, looking back on all the good memories he himself had with Puchita, wondering if their experience could be mirrored. In chapter 8, we have a bit of Power's backstory, at least when it comes to Miaoi, but this isn't my main concern. When she holds Miaoi to her chest, it fades to the current time. She describes the feeling of blood being warm, as the scene transforms yet again into something more. With Denji holding her in his arms gently, he had become a savior for her. What Makima had done for him, he had done for power in a sense. Now, if we look at the scene deeper, her words could also be used not only to describe blood, but Denji's warmth, the subtlety in the artwork here, the look on both of their faces, the way Denji holds her, making sure she's properly elevated. I would argue that this is the moment that sparks something, not in Denji, but power. This is the start of their complicated relationship. Denji leans in closer as power asks, Denji, without saying anything, alludes to touching her chest. Back to square one, I suppose. Power then apologizes for deceiving him. Honestly speaking, I find this very human for her, and it serves as great character development. Moving forward, Denji vouches for Power. Despite everything that happened, even Aki alluding to knowing the truth of the matter, he still took that risk for her. Our spunky fiend moves in with our pair as more of her traits come to a head. She barely bathes, she doesn't flush. Again, first appearances are everything, and Power right now is very, very far from what Denji would consider a dream girl. She doesn't have the mysticism that Makima exudes, nor does she have the same feminine charm as Rize or Makima. That doesn't stop Denji from finding her attractive as he's about to get his reward. Three chest squeezes, but it doesn't live up to Denji's expectations which were extremely high. After all, he risked his life just to feel some boobs. But after he got what he wanted, it wasn't fulfilling. Maybe it was because Power's chest wasn't what he thought it was, her wearing pads and all. Or maybe it was because he had held something so trivial to an unreasonably high pedestal. Now we need to cut back to Makima for a moment. Denji is still very upset at what happened, expressing it to Makima. Here, she does what she does best manipulates Denji sexually, getting intimate with him. Given the fact that Denji has an unhealthy obsession with Makima, this just sends him into overdrive. Moving on from this, we go right back to where we left off on my last point. Rize had been killed and Denji sat alone clutching flowers at the cafe. He's holding on to hope. This is where Fujimoto makes it abundantly clear the direction Denji and Power's relationship is going. At least to me. The owner of the cafe is reasonably annoyed. Denji won't go home and it's past closing time. He expresses Rize was out of his league. And what happened next is amazing foreshadowing for later events if I've ever seen it. He expresses to Denji that he'll meet the girl who's right for him eventually. And then the door cracks. We already know it can be Rize, so the next possible conclusion could be Makima. But no, it's power. The door cracks and Denji initially is excited, but then he sees power. She followed his scent here. She's in love with the flowers Denji has, exclaiming that they're perfect for her as she blushes looking at him. Fujimoto brilliantly breaks up the tension of the scene by having Denji consume the flowers. He does just enough to plant a seed, but not too much. After all, it wouldn't make sense for these characters to just break out into some overly romantic scene right about now. Something that should also be noted that I didn't mention earlier is Denji and Power spend a lot of time together. They train together, they spend their days off together, and while these may not seem important now, 
it's worth mentioning at this moment because this fact comes up later. The next interaction I'd like to take note of is the start of the Darkness Devil arc. Denji, Aki, and Power have a moment together. Power is upset that she isn't rewarded for her hard work. Aki concedes, asking her what she wants, making Ludicrous claim of wanting to suck a human's blood till he dies. Aki agrees as he places that responsibility on Denji. Now, before I talk about why this is so important, there's something you need to understand about this channel. Here, I try to look at every little detail. Sometimes we miss things, even on subsequent rereads or rewatches. I want to go beyond the deep dive and truly dissect and analyze as much as I can when constructing these videos. The little things in particular serves as foreshadowing and again, I bring it up now, but we'll cross that bridge along with my earlier observations when we get there. Trust me, everything will make sense when we enter the final stretch of this analysis. Chapter 71 is an important chapter. It's important for this video, but I'm not gonna say what you think I will. This chapter opens up on the aftermath of the Darkness Devil arc. Power is traumatized, she seeks comfort within Denji, and Denji does play that role of comforter towards her. He tries everything he can just to keep her as calm as possible, even losing sleep and doing something that chapters earlier he would never do as a character. Denji is continuously taking on the responsibility of calming down power throughout this chapter. He feeds her as the panel compares their relationship to his and Makima's, showing how different these two relationships are. It frames Denji as more compassionate and caring person, something that he struggled with at the start of the series. It also shows a drastic difference in relationship dynamics. Makima cleans the rice off his face with her thumb before placing said thumb into her mouth. A small tactic yet manipulative, she is casually asserting her dominance over Denji. This in turn builds as she offers him to go with her on a trip, just the two of them. Denji however refuses her. This was the big shock to me. He had again assumed the responsibility of looking after power, but despite the fact that Makima had offered to let her stay at the public safety facility, Denji is torn, but ultimately decides to turn her down. For the first time since Rize, he actively turns away from a Makima. However, this time there was far less resistance. It shows his growth as a character, his maturity to put others above himself. As power clings to Denji, Aki asks why he didn't go. Denji simply retorts, he doesn't know. What I find funny is that throughout the series, from this point and beyond, Power is constantly clinging to Denji, despite her relationship with Aki being almost the same, she confides in Denji. She comes to him when he's on the toilet for Christ's sake. She's comfortable around him. It screams to me that this outcome was foreshadowed all the way in chapter 6, when he saved her from the Bat Devil, or the Darkness Devil arc, where he risks his life for her so that she wouldn't be turned into a doll. Power sees Denji as a protector, despite his own inadequacies with himself. She puts her trust in him, and that's beautiful. This is when it gets more intimate as the two share a bath together. He leans in closer as he speaks. This doesn't feel erotic at all, and that's weird to him. He doesn't understand why. Later that night, they share another moment as she sleeps with Denji. She opens up and cries, hoping that he doesn't hate her. She feels bad for getting between his trip with Makima for her sake. Denji shrugs this off, but Power persists with her apology, offering him to drink her blood. Remember earlier what Aki promised her? It comes full circle, but instead of her being the one to ingest his blood, it's the inverse. The next panel is beautifully illustrated. Fujimoto uses inherently sexual posing to change Denji's worldview as a character, to challenge his idea of love, his idea of sex. He monologues to himself. Uchida, Makima told me that naughty things feel better the more you know your partner. But even though I know power really well, it doesn't feel hot at all. He continues to think to himself, coming to the conclusion that maybe knowing any and everything about a person you're intimate with isn't true. Thinking that if he knew all the assassins and everyone he had killed personally, it would make him feel crappy. Again, foreshadowing for when he kills Aki. But this entire little monologue is 
powerful, it's beautiful. What Denji and Power exhibit is a real healthy relationship given the circumstances of the bath. It would feel inconsistent and stunt his growth as a character to start having sexual thoughts while Power is in a very vulnerable state. It would paint Denji in a negative light and he would be something that he's not. Denji cares more about Power's well-being that he is able to subconsciously brush aside any sexual urges he might feel. And this is powerful given the fact that he is only 16 and has shown sexual attraction to power before when she had promised him he could grope her. Let's take into consideration every time Denji let his lust control his actions, it had ended poorly for him even with power, almost being killed by the bad devil, then almost being killed by Rize, and being manipulated by Makima into killing his friends. Fujimoto keeps implementing these small things that convey a certain message between the two. Power throughout the series has also been shown to be very possessive of Denji. After she conquers her darkness double fears, we see all three of them sleeping together. Denji's hand is holding her waist. When she begins to live with them, her shirt says Love Radio, the cafe owner's words to Denji, among other things that I've spoken about in this video. Fujimoto's writing and visual storytelling is grossly underrated, to me at least. A lot of people focus on the words but not the things surrounding them. Anime and manga are visual mediums after all. The story is told through words and images. Allow me to elaborate using an example. Let's take a peek at Aki's character. He's a straight shooter who finds sympathizing, befriending, or even living with devils abhorrent. But soon after meeting Denji, he's peeling apples for him as he sits by his bed in a hospital room while he heals from the bat devil incident. Aki Hayakawa expresses concern for a devil. His acts are far more powerful than his words. Fujimoto's literature revolves around this theme. Denji's description of not feeling naughty or erotic while mating with power was simply his realization that one may and can be intimate with someone without being sexual. Denji is indeed figuring out and learning about the intricacies of relationships. He's discovering that physical intimacy with a partner doesn't have to be obviously sexual all the time. In certain cases, intimacy and proximity are for the sake of comfort. Other times, it's for the purpose of strengthening a relationship by extending another's physical limits. It is sometimes sexual, other times it's romantic, and other times it is platonic. The aftermath of Aki's death brings Power and Denji closer. Denji, in fact, gets to live out a dream he had proclaimed at the start of chapter 1. When speaking to Pachita, Denji said that he'd flirt with a girl. They'd play video games together in their room, and he'd fall asleep in her arms. In this chapter, he talks about playing video games with Power. He rents a new apartment, and throughout the series, he and Power have been sleeping together. More so her in Denji's arms than what he initially wanted. Not too long after, Power is killed by Makima. This is where Makima reveals, similar to Aizen, she had been controlling Denji's entire life, perfectly orchestrating everything. She says that she gave him a brother with Aki and a bratty little sister with power. As Denji's on the verge of being killed by Makima, he's saved by none other than power, all because of that blood he had drank earlier. She fights tooth and nail to protect Denji, but suddenly the events change as if Makima is exercising her control ability. Power almost gives up Denji to her before all of their memories flash before her, every intimate moment causing her to defy Makima. Even she doesn't understand why she did it. But alas, she retreats into a dumpster as a similar scene plays out to that of chapter 1 and 2 where Pachita makes a contract with Denji. Fujimoto uses a panel from Denji's first meeting with Power, a panel right before he saves her life, but the dialogue is changed. Power expresses that all lives are equal, important. But Denji can't die because he was her first friend. Honestly, that tears me up every time I read it. It could be interpreted in many ways, but I'll get into that later. They too share a powerful moment where Denji recounts his life. He had fulfilled his dreams. He flirted with a girl, which I assume he's talking about Rize. He got to play video games with Power and I'm assuming Aki and he slept next to Power. All of his dreams stated in chapter 1 had been accomplished. He doesn't want to live anymore. He even remarked that Power won't be there if he were to return to the world of the living. He misses Power so much that he refuses to do anything, or rather, he can't do anything. Power gives Denji the last bit of motivation he needs, giving him hope that the two would see each other again, and that they could be buddies again. The two form a contract, and the events of the ending unfold. Now that that's all over, let's look at a few things. 
I said earlier that I had issue with people using Makima's words as definitive proof. After all, Makima isn't there 24-7. She doesn't know everything that's happening behind closed doors. She just executes what she believes would happen. Regardless of if Power and Denji's relationship were really that of siblings, it does matter because Makima still accomplished what she set out to do. I would argue the fact that Power and Denji became so close was the catalyst that led to Makima's defeat in the first place because power was the one that gave Denji that last bit of strength that he needed to defeat Makima. Now, as we saw, Rize had died. Her body was taken over by Makima and Denji had no remorse for killing her. It isn't crazy to assume that Denji had moved on, but it could also be stated that he had no time to worry about Rize. Or maybe I'm just looking too deep into this whole Rize thing. Now, I'm going to throw a counter argument to myself. It could be interpreted due to Denji not having any siblings that everything that had happened between him and Power is what he would assume normal sibling relationships to be. It could even be said for Power, even more so, but I don't believe this. I think Denji has enough understanding to surmise siblings don't do what he and Power did. As for Power, I could counter argue with her being afraid of getting naughty or even enjoying Denji touching her chest. However, most of her words come off as platonic, calling Denji her buddy her first friend, but not once do Denji and Power refer to themselves as siblings. All in all, I think Tatsuki Fujimoto clearly portrays a lot of sexual undertones with the pair, romantic undertones even, yet still using platonic vocabulary. He wants this relationship to be ambiguous, leaving it up for readers' interpretations, so he sprinkles in a lot of conflicting language both visually and vocally. Some of it goes unnoticed at first, but when you reread the series, it starts becoming more apparent. One last sentiment, even if he did want the two to be seen purely as siblings, Fujimoto himself has a very complicated thought process at least in his stories when it comes to siblings. Look at Fire Punch for example. It has a lot of very incestual things going on in the manga between the main character and his sister. Chainsaw Man to me is a series that is about characters trying to find their place in the world, trying to understand things without anyone to guide them. Denji is his own teacher when it comes to things such as love and relationships. I truly believe that Fujimoto was trying to communicate that Power was the ideal woman for Denji, but he just couldn't see it. Whether it be due to Makima's ability as the control devil, or for the simple fact that he himself had no idea what love really is and how it's supposed to be. Makima may have been his first crush, he may even say that he loves her, but I believe Power is the girl that he truly loved. Anyway, this is the end of the video, I hope you enjoyed anything I had to say. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this subject in the comments below. Do you think Fujimoto will continue this idea in part 2? Do you think Power will come back? This is Grimtoki, this has been Beyond Animation, and I'll see you in the next one. Peace.